Well, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the first in our series this summer. And uh, we have a visit that'll bring back a little bit of nostalgia. We'll be visiting the old the movie houses, you know, the park and the spread, whichever one you went to uh, when you were in the Royal. Now, as a reminder, uh, all of our lecture series is uh, sponsored by Grimshaw Goodewitz. Uh, again, this year, and they're sponsoring this presentation tonight. We have at the table uh, two items. Uh, one, if you're looking for what the summer series is, and it consists of four uh, this year, you can pick it up at the table. And most importantly, uh, if you're not a member of our society at this point, uh, do consider picking up an application. Uh, I'll turn everything over to Bob. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the first of the lectures. Um, we've been doing this for a number of years now, and we try to come up with, with, with topics that would, might interest people. I'm very pleased with the crowd tonight, considering that the advertisement for this lecture will be in tomorrow's newspaper. <laughs> <laughs> but but it's, it's not too bad, okay? So we did a lot of stuff on the net and things. A couple of years ago, about three years ago, I did a program, if you remember, on when the circus came to town. And of course, the circus was something, a big thing in the summertime, but it was only entertainment while it was here. It would soon leave. Two years ago, I did uh, a program on a lady named Rose Wentworth, who was a Fall Riverite, who went on to make her fortune in the circus. But in any case, the movies are something that affected everybody, and I think Everybody here has got a story about going to the movies. They were certainly a big part of your life. I spent many, many hours in the Strand Theater on Saturday afternoons for my mother for 25 cents plus 10 cents for a box of popcorn. Got rid of me for an entire afternoon from about one to five. At the same time, uh, <clears throat> my interest in movies uh, it increased a little bit because my dad worked at the Strand Theater in the mid-1950s. And of course, you may know where the Strand was. It was one of the neighborhood theaters. And then I got into the service, and when in the service, I ended up, uh, I had the, a kind of deal where I was a watch stander. So I got, for every day I had, I had the watch, I got the next day off. If you hung around the ship, they put you to work. So I would walk uptown, go to the USO, get a free ticket to a movie, come out of the movie, go to the, uh, there was a place on Washington Street that had spaghetti that they cooked in the window, I remember. After the spaghetti, I go back at another free ticket at the USO. So I spent my two movies at that particular time. And then uh, whenever we went out to see the big entertainment, there was no satellite dishes or things in those days. We had movies. and. They would give us a whole bunch of movies, and that's what, what, what entertained us for the four or the five weeks that we're out to see. We never got enough movies for every day, but we got to watch some of them two or three times, just in case they changed the endings on them. <laughs> so I call the program, let's, go to the, uh, let's all go to the movies. What I really wanted to call it originally was, take your girly to the movies. Have you heard that song? 1919, there was a song called Take Your Girlie to the Movies. And I always remembered it as being, take your girlie to the movies so you won't sit home alone. But those were not the real words. The real words ran something like this. Take your girlie to the movies if you can't make love at home. <laughs> There's not little brother there who always squeals. You can say an awful lot in seven reels. Take your lessons to, at the movies and have love scenes of your own. When the picture's over and it's time to leave, don't forget to brush the powder off your sleeve. Take your girly to the movies if you can't make love at home. <laughs> and the last one, the last verse is, take your girly to the movies if you can't make love at home. Pick a cozy corner where it's nice and dark. Don't catch influenza kissing in the park. <laughs> Song is written 1919. Joyce reminded me that in 1918 was the flu epidemic, the Spanish flu. 
Okay, so the, the, this guy puts it in the song a year later. Take your lessons at the movies and have love scenes of your own. Though she's just a simple little ribbon clerk, choose, close your eyes and think you're kissing Billy Burke. <laughs> Billy Burke was uh, the Ziegfeld Follies, and again, uh, so she was one of the stars. And take your girly to the movies if you can't make love at home. So we thought those lyrics were maybe a little bit too much for Fall River. So we're going to show you um, a, a tamer version. This is the junior version, OK? Listen to the words. Okay, those are the JV lyrics of the song. And of course, Lawrence Welk um, would not use the original lyrics, I'm sure. <laughs> okay, Nick. Theaters in Florida, some dates you want to remember. Silent movies were only around yeah, about 1903 or so. The first talkie was 1929. It was called The Jazz Singer. So all of the movies between the turn of the 20th century and 1929 are silent movies. Now in 1895, there are five theaters listed in the city directory. The Academy of Music was the Academy Theater, and that goes way back. The Casto Theater was on 20 Rock Street across from the Second District Court. You're going to see a lot of theaters with that address. Evidently, what they did was kept changing the name, hoping that the next one would be more successful than the one that just failed. The Casto was kind of interesting. It was a vaudeville house. And I went through the Clipper, which is the trade, mag it was the trade newspaper for the uh, theater people. And I just typed in Fall River. And there are pages of references. And a lot of them were just ads. And there's one from the Casto, where the manager is giving this act a, a, a lot of praise and saying he'll hire them back again. And it, evidently, it was a gym and comedy act. And they were so good. Even the, even the newspaper, the floor of a paper, actually uh, mentioned that particular act that, <coughs> that, um, and how good they were. The Flint Museum, I guess, was a storefront deal. Probably a few artifacts that the guy owned. And maybe a small theater. He's trying to be P.T. Bonham on a small scale. Probably lasted about a year, if that. The Nickelodeon is an interesting thing. The name Nickelodeon is associated with silent movie theaters. And here in 1895, before there were silent movies, there it is. But it disappears the next year. It doesn't come back until the early 1900s. So evidently, the Nickelodeon simply means they charge a nickel for the movies. And Rich's Theater was on 2nd Street. Rich's Theater, if you remember where the Empire was, the Empire's front was in on Main Street. Riches was on 2nd Street. Now, they weren't together. They tore Riches down when they built the Empire Theater. So this goes, that's one of the older theaters. Okay. Here's just a partial listing. I went through and 
I just keep finding more and more all the time. So you see a lot of different theaters. A lot of them you'll, you'll recognize. A lot of them you will not recognize. For instance, the, uh, you'll notice that last one there, the One Cent Vaudeville Theater. So I don't know what kind of a show you saw for a penny. My guess, it was probably an amateur show. And the only people that won anything was the, uh, basically, was the, um, the winner of the contest. My dad had a pretty good voice, and he and another guy used to go around and they would sing in amateur shows. The winner got $5. The condition was that you couldn't come back for two weeks, so they'd give somebody else a chance to win. But they would take the trolley or the train to Warren or to New Bedford, and what they would do is they'd sing there, and sometimes they'd win at that particular theater. So my guess is that that particular theater there didn't last very long. The one cent vaudeville uh, is not really enticing. I don't know, as again, how much you'd see. So vaudeville, what did people see in Florida before there were movies? It was vaudeville. America's Got Talent the biggest vaudeville show in the world. That's what you saw in vaudeville. You singers, dancers, acrobats, OK? And it was just a mixture of things. And that's what entertained people. And there were several vaudeville theaters in the city. They, were all, they also entertained minstrel shows that would be coming through, and also legitimate theater on occasion. Now, here are some of the, uh, we found these pictures in the archives. Please, if you ever have a picture on the back in pencil, identify who it is or where it was taken, if, because otherwise it's just a picture. Now, we don't know whether these people are Fall Riverites or not, but they were in our, in our archives. My guess is the, the trio that you see over here, this is a, a dance trio in here uh, by the costuming. This fellow here is probably a song and dance man. The Daly Brothers are rather interesting. They're Far Riverites. And they're doing a, a, a hand balancing act. But the blow off, or the big trick in the act, is right here. At, what happens is they get a teeter board. One guy comes and stands at this end of the teeter board. The other guy runs, jumps on this end. This guy goes through the air, and they land head to head with no hands. Ouch. <laughs> My guess is they had some sort of padding, and my guess also is that they didn't really go that high in the air. It might have been sort of like this, but it was still a pretty decent trick. Now, before the, any type of projection thing, what might, uh, before the movies came, you did have the, these devices here, magic lantern shows. Now, what Magic Lantern shows did was a fellow would come buy one of these projectors. You can buy them now, by the way. There are companies that produce them. The slides were all glass slides, hand tinted. And they were mostly travel logs and that sort of thing. So a guy would come into town with this Magic Lantern, rent a storefront, advertise. People would come in. After you've seen slides of Italy a couple of times, they're the same all the time. Business drops off, the guy picks up his equipment, goes to the next town. And basically is how, how that would work. But this is not a movie, by the way. That those are still. There are lots of people in the late 1890s that are working on movies. Uh, <clears throat> Thomas Edison was working on them. They're having a difficult time. Movies work on the idea, why do they move? You've got to take a whole series of pictures, continuous. Your brain remembers the last picture, and the next picture is superimposed on that, and the next one superimposed and gives you the motion. Seems simple. Solving the problem was a little more difficult. So they began to build projectors. One of the things that went wrong with the, was the fact that they took too many frames per second, 40, 50 frames a second. So you'd have this big reel for a one minute movie. So a lot of the early Silent movies were one or two minutes long. Maybe not even that. These two guys, the Lumiere brothers, are the, really the fathers of the cinema. They produce a camera that is, doesn't take as many frames per second, and also the, it is easy to carry. And they sell them primarily to, 
itinerants, people moving from place to place. Fall Riverites probably saw their, for, their first movies in a storefront where a guy showed up with his projector, rented the store, advertised, and then showed his, 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 his movies. And again, some of them were 50 to 60 seconds long. But he would have several of these, of course. What's rather interesting is, you know, my interest in circus. In 1897, the, the Ringling Brothers Circus carried a black tent, which was a black canvas tent. And they projected movies in there. And so when you went to see the circus for an extra charge, you got to see some movies. 1897 now. Okay. Now, what worked well in silent movies? Everything had to be exaggerated, OK? Comedy worked well, but it couldn't be very subtle. It couldn't be a couple of guys telling jokes. Okay, it had to be very, very broad comedy, okay, so that you could see it. People also liked horror movies. The Phantom of the Opera with Lon Chaney was one of those, and they had the unmasking, and he was really horrible looking, okay. People liked to be scared. People liked to be, uh, get the chance to laugh. So the, the, they're sort of at the opposite ends of the spectrum. Drama is a little more difficult. And so there were lots of comedians and this one here happens to be Buster Keaton. Remember, there was Charlie Chaplin and others. So we get a small piece on Buster Keaton, and you can see the broad comedy that they have here. That's funny.
So, so you have Buster Keaton. Actually, Buster was a very clever man, and he wanted to do more in the movies, but the studios kind of kept him down. They just wanted to make money, and if, if they thought people liked what he was doing in the first place, they didn't want him doing new things, which people might not like, okay? So and that continues on right, right up till today. Now, the, the silent movies, again, from 1903 up to 1927, what we end up with in, in, in 19, from the end of, somebody was working on the, on, on talkies, okay? And what you had to do was get the sound onto the film. And the problem was in getting it synchronized. There's nothing worse than watching a TV show where the lips are going like this and it doesn't match up with what's being, with, with the sound. And that basically was the problem that they had with these things. And so, so getting them uh, sort of together in, synch in, synch uh, <clears throat> in synchronization. So in any case, um, about 1927, they start to solve the problem. And from 15 months, from the end of 1927 to early 1929, Silent movies left, and talkies came in, and the silent movies never had a chance. I mean, it wasn't that they, they, they stayed a few more years. All of the movie theaters just switched over. I was thinking, many years ago when I was in high school, I remember watching your show of shows with Sid Caesar and Imogene Coca, and they did a thing about a silent movie star named Rex Hansom. And I, and I thought it was kind of funny and it, and it was a silent movie star who eventually goes into, uh, into the talkies. And guess what? We found it. So here it is over here. We can... Gives it the Taj Mahal for it. Thank you. 
That's Nanette Fabre, by the way. And that actually happened. There were many movie stars who never made it past silent movies. There, there were some very beautiful women uh, who, uh, you know, they had a Brooklyn accent that they couldn't work around. I'm amazed today when I see British actors coming over, they sound more American than we do, or Australian actors and actresses. But in any case, that actually happened. So what I'd like to do now is just take a look at the victim at the various theaters and give you a little bit of background on them. The oldest theater in the city was the Academy of Music. Okay, it was built as a legitimate theater. Okay, they brought in, uh, you know, traveling companies, plays, and there was uh, probably enough business and for enough people with money to go to these. But this was probably for the, uh, certainly the, the middle class, what middle class there was and, and up. So again, the Academy of Music, built in 1876, What's kind of interesting here, if you look, we've come across a number of these cards, which I think we picked up on um, eBay. And these are theater cards, and done by MGM, as you can see. And essentially, are they using our products or not? And you can see it's got the, on the, on the main floor, 900 seats, and the balcony, uh, uh, it says 500 seats. Uh, let me see, is that the numbers? Uh, actually, it, it, it was, that was probably after the renovation that they did in the 1840s, okay? Now, again, built as a legitimate theater. Uh, again, you can see, you, everybody knows where it was in here. 
And then this was the box office. And again, remember, there were stores on the first floor. You had to go up the stairs. And the theater was on the second floor, two balconies, which would then be on the, what, the third and fourth floors. And again, they, they you know, the, the later theaters with the, with the large chandeliers, and every time when they went to change these lights, this thing was usually on a, on a rope structure, so you'd lower it all down to the floor and, and change the burned out lights and clean the crystals. I don't know whether they ever did that or not, to be honest with you. The ceiling you can see here, and it had an orchestra, it had a first balcony. This was called the Parquet Circle over here that ran around. You might notice that the second balcony has got wooden benches. And those, the wooden benches uh, were really uncomfortable. And uh, after a while, they closed that, that second balcony and they never used it again. It was built as a legitimate theater. And again, it had a stage about 36 feet wide, 35 feet high. 45 feet deep so that you can put on production. So it was a legitimate theater. You can see over here the, uh, the stairways coming up and this one going up to the balcony. What's kind of interesting here, you get a shot of this orchestra here. You see these little white spots on the seats? The theater had really deteriorated. You know, kids cut the seats, the seats just wore out. And they repaired them with that shiny duct tape. And that's what's reflecting in here. Uh, the theater, as it got toward the end, it ended up as an adult theater, and they showed adult movies. And when that happens, the theater is usually pretty much at the end of its run. We had a neighbor one time who had, she had five children, but she was a little bit naive. And it was summertime, and she said, one day she came over, she said, I like to take the kids to the movies. And she says, this, like, they got a kid's movie down at, at the academy. So I said, at the academy? She said, yes, yeah, Cinderella is playing. So I went and checked the paper, except Cinderella was spelled with an S. <laughs> <laughs> Again, the, the, the building that you see over here, well, this is kind of neat. Here's, of course, this is Pleasant Street here. There's the Roma Cafe, you know, that was sort of was subterranean, if I recall. And then the, 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 the stairways going up. This is the actual theater plan. The theater was renovated in the, uh, in the 1940s. What's kind of interesting, uh, the two guys that worked on it was Nathan Yamans, who was involved in a lot of theaters in Fall River, and a guy named Carl Zeitz, Zeiterian in New Bedford. Carl Zeitz ran the Academy Theater in the 1940s after the, after the renovation. And again, here is where it's closed as you can see. The theaters didn't open in the, summer, in, the, in the summertime way back when. There was no air conditioning, very uncomfortable in the, in the theaters. And so the, the, they made most of their money in the wintertime. When air conditioning came in, that was a big thing. This is kind of interesting. This guy shows up as a ghost over here. I think he's the theater cleaning, cleaner. I'll tell you some stories about cleaning theaters after. But notice the seats, how beat up they are. This had to be at the end of the, the academy's um, run. Now before we get to the Nickelodeon, I want to mention Rich's Theater. We don't have a picture of Rich's Theater. Rich's Theater was built on 2nd Street, as I mentioned. When they built the Empire, they tore Rich's down. Rich's opened up as a vaudeville theater, and at one point, it was a burlesque theater. Now, I'm trying to figure, it can't be, I'm thinking burlesque, probably it was more comedy and girl dances as opposed to um, the, more of the variety type of show that you would see in a vaudeville show. That's the best I can think. But it, it, at one point, Riches did uh, have a, uh, <clears throat> a burlesque, uh, put on a burlesque show. And in 1954, a fellow wrote an article for the paper going back and he remembered the theater and he said, the thing about that, it was very difficult for a man to get, man to get into that theater without being seen. Uh, the, and I can remember back in the 1960s, if the, uh, the Embassy Theater showed a movie called The Moon is Blue. Maybe you remember that? And it was, again, one of those sensational movies. And so what happened was uh, a friend of mine, my neighbor next door, went down to see the movie, and he said, when you get in there, there were like 12 people. The lights went out, and all you could hear was feet, and people were coming in while the lights were out. <laughs> and then when, when the movie was ending, all you could hear were 
feet and everybody was leaving and turn around, the same 12 people that were there at the beginning were still sitting there. Okay. So again, Rich's Theater, uh, they had boxing in there. Uh, they had a number of things. We, I do find ads in the, in the clipper for Rich's Theater. And the, they're looking for a vaudeville acts, actually. The Nickelodeon was down where the, where the bank is now, at the, way down Pleasant Street. And my dad went to the Nickelodeon, and, and he mentioned, uh, uh, he used to say that uh, after work, he would go downtown to the bowling alley, and he would set pins. He said, I'd set pins all night, and people never had money to bowl, so he might set five strings. Penny a string, he'd get five cents. And he said the big thing was, do you go to the Nickelodeon, or do you go to the bakery? And the bakery would take old pastries, and somehow I think they would just crumble them and mash them into a, and give a very generous serving of this cake, which was a mixture of all what was left over, essentially. So we had to make the big decision where he was going to spend his nickel. So the Nickelodeon ran. The silent movies generally had, sometimes they had a pan, just a pan, Nickelodeon had just a piano player. And again, he played the background, the sort of background music. If there was a gunshot, he'd hit the, the, the key, you know, the, for the, the, uh, <clears throat> to represent the gunshot. So the Nickelodeon, again, went out of business after a while. Uh, there were Nickelodeons all over the place. The Bijou. Okay, the Bijou Theater, uh, and it was in business prior to 1904. You can see it right over here. This is on South Main Street. This is, North pardon? It says North Main. Oh, I'm sorry, North Main Street. That is, this is on North Main Street here, okay? And this is the Bijou Theater right here. And their main claim to fame was, their advertisement was Four Rivers New Ground Floor Theater. And that's probably a reference to the academy where you had to go up some stairs. So if you had difficulty climbing stairs, you'd go to the Bijou rather than the academy. Later on, it got converted to a restaurant. And I only went in that restaurant once. My, after World War II, my, my <clears throat> I had a cousin get married, and they had the wedding reception. He had, they had a little room up in the upstairs right here. And so it became the Bijou restaurant. It's kind of a neat little, little theater here. This was also on North Main Street, but where the Durfee Theater is, was today. And this was built as the Savoy in 1905. And again, built as a <clears throat> vaudeville house and as a silent movie theater. 1905 giving that away. It did have two balconies, OK? So it had a double balcony. It was renamed the Rialto in 1921. So it got, had a different name, and it was destroyed in the 1928 fire. Now, in this picture here, you'll see Sheedy's uh, uh, vaudeville. Sheedy, I think, was a Far River guy because there was a theater in Far River named Sheedy's Theater down on Lower Pleasant Street, and it was a vaudeville theater. And so my guess is what he's doing is just renting this theater and then bringing in his own show. The premier theater was on 20 Rock Street. That's where the castle was, okay, across from the district court. And it was opened around 1911. I think that's the earliest date that I could find in the city directories. It closed in 1920. It reopened in 1926, and it burnt down in 1928. And again, my guess is mostly movies they may have had some uh, vaudeville as well, but I think it was mostly movies. The Palace Theater is on Bedford Street. Here's the old post office here, and here's the Palace Theater here, just up. The fire bond would be over in here. And you see it's got this false front on it. And the Palace Theater was built uh, sometime before 1911, and again, I'm, I'm guessing that it pr was primarily a silent movie theater. And it was on the corner of 2nd Street. Uh, the Empire, as you can see here. The Empire was one of the two big theaters in the city. The Empire was built as a vaudeville house, OK? And it was built in, opened in 1918. And what's interesting is they tore the richest theater down, which was on the back of it, to make room. Now, it's a vaudeville theater. In other words, you get live people coming in. And what do they forget to build? Dressing rooms. No dressing rooms. 
Okay, so what they did is they built a lean-to against the side of the theater. It looks like a two-story house, and they put the dressing rooms in there. And I can remember going down with my dad, and, and I think we saw the ink spots in here one time. Probably it was during World War II. I was just a kid. They used to also have uh, bond drives, and invariably they'd have them down here at the Empire Theater. They'd have some movie star come in, and you know, you'd see the movie star, and they'd give a pitch, and people would run down and buy war bonds at the time. It was demolished, the, the, uh, the Empire Theater was demolished in 1962. You probably, uh, what they did was, I think they built that little enclosed mall, remember, before they put the courthouse in, which, which never did, ever did very well. And here's the card for the Empire Theater here. And you notice that the transient population, as they say. So it was a pretty good sized theater, over 1,000 seats on the main floor. Balcony of 750, that's a pretty good size. Uh, next, OK. What's kind of interesting here, Johnny Weissmiller, when I was a kid, my, the things we wanted to see was cowboys and Indians. We wanted to see comedy. We wanted to see Tarzan. And Johnny Weissmiller was a, a uh, an Olympic swimmer, and the only part that he ever played, as far as I know, was because he didn't have to speak very much. He just kind of grunted a few words, and I remember, and it was, uh, and Tarzan, it, the, that was per primarily his main, his main role. Over here, you'll see, the, uh, there's a band here, and I'm going to guess that this was probably around World War II, and they're probably trying to raise money for war bonds. And as I said, the Empire seemed to be the, the theater at the time. The Park Theater was, of course, out the globe. And this was one of the few theaters that I never, ever made it into. This was built, opened in December of 1920. And this was a Nathan Yeamans theater. My dad worked at the Strand. They used to ad make one advertisement, the Park and the Strand. They showed the same, the same uh, pictures. And by the way, they changed their pictures three times a week. I think it was Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then Friday and Saturday. Saturday afternoon was the kids' matinee when you'd have hordes of children coming down into, uh, uh, to see whatever movies they were. And again, here's the card. I didn't realize the park was that big, over 1,100 seats on the main floor and 510 in the balcony. And again, I, well, I get a kick here because it says that there, there was low income, you see, the patronage. Then they made it general because I think they fixed it up a little bit. <laughs> the Strand, now this was, this was my theater. Okay, the Strand, this is the old Strand. Okay, this was the first neighborhood movie theater in the city. 1918, it was built by the J.M. Dowling Company. Okay, Boy Dowling Pardon's father, I believe it was. Uh, and again, this is the old strand. It was refurbished in, the in 1948, and it was a good sized theater. It had 1,200 seats on the first floor and 270 in the balcony. And the patronage was low income. I didn't know we were low income. Um, but everybody in the theater, we all seemed to be the same. So I guess we were all low income. Uh, but in any case, it was kind of a, uh, it was a great place to go. For a quarter, my, mo my mother got rid of me uh, for the whole, all of Saturday afternoon. She threw on another dime, I got a box of popcorn. Now I get a kick, you go to the movies today, what is it, eight dollars for a box of popcorn. Okay, 10 cents. And they were put into boxes. And my dad worked for the Eastern Mass Bus Company. And in the 50s, remember they had the strike. And the strike lasted so long that by the time the strike was over, everybody had gone out and bought automobiles. They bought their first cars. They weren't going to put up with the buses anymore. So my dad lost his job, and he ends up working in the Strand Theater. Now, the Strand Theater was the type of job where he cleaned the inside of the theater, which meant that he did it seven days a week. His day off, he still had to clean the inside. He just got the afternoon and night off. He would also, on Saturday, there would be 
you know, all of these kids, hundreds of kids in there, and they all had a box of popcorn. And the way you cleaned the theater was you used a leaf blower. And you went down between the rows of seats and you blew all of the popcorn boxes down. And when you got down four or five rows, you couldn't do it anymore because they all jammed up. So now you had to go and sweep them out, put it in barrels, and then start again. And on Sunday mornings, the phone would ring and I knew it was my dad. And he was stuck because he had to go back in the afternoon. And boy, I used to say, maybe I'll fake like I'm sleeping and I, I didn't wake up. And I never had the heart to do that. So I would end up running down and help my dad clean the theater. Fortunately, I had some friends and once in a while they'd find a dime or something and they, <laughs> that was like, they, they were sort of like going on a treasure hunt. You see, they might, they might, once I think a guy found a dollar and that was it. They said you could do a lot with it then. So in any case, it was remodeled in 48. They took the balcony out, by the way, at that time. This is, if you go back one, if you would. this again is the new theater here. It did not have an aisle down the side. It had two main aisles and that was it. So if you sat in here, you kind of were stuck against the wall. Here's the outer lobby over here. The ticket booth was, was up in this particular place right here. Around the world in 80 days. This is the old strand, and much more elaborate. The new strand, the, the stage I noticed was very narrow. It was never made for anything but movies. And then here's the, the, the candy stand over here where they sold all those boxes of popcorn. Okay. And it's a nice, nice, nice shot of the, of, of the theater. So we sp I spent a lot of time in the Strand Theater. And of course, I didn't have to pay to see the movies because my dad worked there. And I'd always bring a friend along so we'd, we'd go in and, and see the movies for free. Now, what's kind of interesting, they always had these special deals for, to get school kids in. This is Romeo and Juliet. This is a movie, by the way. Ma uh, Margot Fontaine and Rudolf Nureyev. This is the uh, Romeo and Juliet. You'll notice special student prices. And this would be a field trip for the kids. Okay. Now, the reason the nun story here is this is the one time that the Strand had a coup. They got a first-rate run movie first. Normally, you got it five weeks after it played the Durfee. But we got, actually got the movie first. And they invited every parochial school in the area. Every nun in Fall River saw this movie for free. <laughs> and for some strange reason, Norm Zalkin was running the theater. He was Nathan Yeaman's son-in-law. And for some reason, I was standing around, and he decided I would make a good usher. And they had on this old usher's jacket that for a guy, a guy that weighed about 200 pounds, and they gave, the thing was down here. They gave me a flashlight. And remember, you would go down to help people find seats. And once in a while, you'd have a guy would be sitting, empty seat, fill seat, empty seat. There'd be a couple that come in, and you got to try to cajole the guy into moving over so that they could sit together in any case. But they actually, it was a first run movie that was first run so for, for the Strand Theater. So it was, it was kind of fun, nice memories of, of the Strand. The Strand ended up at the end again, it was renovated at, 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 and ended up as, they called it Cinema One and I think it ended up showing adult movies again. That's the death knell for a movie. When you see that, you know, it's really at the end of the line. The Plaza, now to go to the Plaza, you had to get combat training because this was the toughest theater in the city. Now, the only theater that I know, they hired a constable. Now, a constable was a sort of an auxiliary policeman who had a badge but no uniform. And his job was to keep the kids in line. And it was the noisiest place. You couldn't hear anything. Of course, it was a, cowboys and Indians. No one cared. Nobody cared what the dialogue was. They just, they were, and, it, and there'd be kids and everybody be talking at the, at, at the top of their long, uh, voices. And, and so it, it was really kind of a tough place. I went there once. And I think my mother said, you can't go there anymore. For, for me, it was a, a pretty good walk. And again, what happened to the plaza? You, you notice, by the way, here's the hotel plaza here. <laughs> And then this later became the Camelot Inn. You might remember that up on, okay, the Camelot Inn. But it be, well, guess what? It becomes a adult movie theater. The end of the line. It had about 800 seats. 
the Duffy. The Duffy was the queen of the theaters, okay? John McAvoy, we got all, all of his, and I went through a lot of what John McAvoy said about the various theaters because he worked in just about all of them. And this was the, really the finest theater. It was designed by Maud Darling Pardon. It opened in 1929, okay? Because it was a, a, a talking movie theater. So they, the talkies were in. And one month after they opened, the depression hit. The stock market crashed. It had 50, over 1,500 seats in the theater. And, uh, oh, it, right here. Again, you can see it, it, 1391 downstairs, 838 upstairs. So it was a, good, it was a big theater. It was de designed after the Alhambra. You can see the balcony here. And you know that really in the 60s, they brought, actually brought in touring companies here. And we, I remember we had season tickets uh, to, to go down and see them. And of course, shortly thereafter, they decided to turn it into a, into a bank. Uh, it's rather interesting. It gets its name from William Durfee, who was one of the investors in the bank. And who else is in it? Nathan Yeamans, OK? He's also got money in here. Now, why didn't they name it the Yeamans Theater? That's not going to work, OK? Durfee is a name in Fall River. So you know, the Durfee High School, Durfee everything. So Durfee Theater is, is something that's going to sell tickets. Uh, the opening show, by the way, was Coconuts with the Marx Brothers. You notice it very elaborate. These little boxes here I don't think were ever designed for people to sit in. I don't remember ever seeing anybody sitting in there because they were too small. Here's the fish pond over here. Now John McAvoy says that when they opened all the seats, but they were, they, served, they were reserved seats. So you can see this is a reserved seat. Now, what happened, Sunday night was movie night in Fall River. Now, my mother-in-law would always tell me the story that every Saturday night, she and her boyfriend would go dancing at the place called Wilbur's on the Taunton, which was, I guess, a dance hall. And every Sunday night, they went to the Durfee, every Sunday night, and they sat in exactly the same seats in the loges, the front row in the balcony. And so, and that was something you just did all of the time. And it was very much a part of your life. Because the movies n never played more than a week. So there was always a new movie showing. And again, the Bob Hope movie here. You notice most of the movies had a you know, double feature. They tried doing one movie like they do today. But they all went to double features. And this one also has the Lewis, Lewis, Lewis Walcott fight, which is just a movie of the fight, by the way. And again, this is the inner lobby, the, here's the, 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 the candy stand, the, the fish pond, the stairs going up to the balcony. This is the, uh, the inner lobby over here. McAvoy says that on Sunday evenings, between the next to last show and the last show, there would be 5,000 people, 2,500 coming out, 2,500 behind a rope here waiting to go in. Now, when we were kids, we go to the movies. We just went whenever we, you know, you go in in the middle, right? And then what you would do is you'd see the end, and then you'd see the middle. You'd see the beginning later on, and if you like the end, you'd stay, see it again. So, the, but if you went to the big theaters downtown, and again, another good shot. Did we have the, um, oh, here, yeah. There was a restaurant here. There was China Royal was right next door. I can recall I had my, my first date was the Duffy Theater. My sister-in-law, I was, I think, seven or eight years old. My brother was in the Army, stationed in India. My sister-in-law took me down to the China Royal and then to the Duffy Theater. And so I, and I still remember that as my, my, the first time, my first date, by the way. Uh, if you didn't like the, if you like something a little fancier than the China Royal, you went across the street to the Eagle. It was still a Chinese restaurant, but just didn't look like one. And the Capitol. By the way, to give you some idea, on Sundays, John McAvoy said on Sundays, they had 12 ushers at the Durfee Theater. There would be one usher in each of the outside aisles, two in each of the center aisles. 
four in the balcony, and two working out in the lobby. Twelve ushers to, 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 to control the crowd. And of course, there again, there were people looking for seats. If you had an unreserved seat, they'd go and find a seat for you. If your seat was reserved, then you didn't have to worry about it. So it was, it was rather interesting. They also had uh, midnight shows. The Durfee and Empire would run a midnight show at on New Year's Eve, and again, uh, and the movie would get out. They'd start at 11:30. They'd have they celebrate midnight with balloons and things, and then the movie would get out about three o'clock in the morning. The Capitol was just up the street here, and again, the Capitol was a second-run theater. The movies generally went from the Durf Durfee to the Capitol. This opened in 1927. And what's kind of, it, it had, uh, again, I think we have a card for that. Yeah, we do. We have about 1,000 seats downstairs and a little over 500 up in the balcony. They had the fanciest ladies' room of any of the theaters, round. Which reminds me, by the way, of the Durfee. When Durfee had a matron in the ladies' room, too, in, the, in those early days. A matron, somebody to keep it, keep it clean. They also, when they showed the movie Frankenstein, they had a nurse available just in case you passed out. So, you know, times change in any case. But here's the capital over here. Again, a, a second run. Now, I'm going to guess that when this movie shows, the, the, the theater is getting to the end of its lifetime again, okay? This is the capital in some of you, the Garden of Eden, and it's in color. And it's photographed in a real nudist park <laughs> under the supervision and with the approval of the American Sunbathing Association. I guess that's the imprimatur, right? Uh, and what's rather interesting, adults only, the second hit is the Frontier Gambler. Okay, so they throw in a cowboy movie with it. And, uh, and my guess is that was probably close to the end. And again, I, I always get a kick uh, uh, on all of these days. W one of the things they had at the Capitol was they had lover's seats. At the end of certain rows, it was a double wide seat. So you could sit with your girl. There was no arm in between the two seats. <laughs> or if you needed a little more room, it was a seat that you could get and, and feel comfortable in, in any case. Okay, the Center Theater was really the last big theater built in the city, 1940. Uh, it had an orchestra and a balcony, of course. It had, uh, in its later life, they, they split it and they had, it was a twin screen theater. The balcony was one, the ground floor was the other. Uh, McAvoy tells a rather interesting story about, there was a movie showing and he said to the nuns, some nuns that, that was telling them about the movie, they said, oh, we'd like to see that. But we couldn't be seen going into the theater. So John said, well, I tell you what, you come down and what I'll do is I'll, I'll sit you in the balcony because nobody else will be up there and I'm going to show you where to go. And he took them up behind the theater and they went up with the fire escape and all the ten nuns were standing on the fire escape. John went around, opened the door, somebody got a hold of him, he started to talk, he forgot all about the nuns. <laughs> so he ended up, remember when he opened the door, there they were, they were all shivering and cold, waiting to, to come in, but they came into the movie anyway and got to see it for free. Uh, the, the, it closed in 1985, it was the last downtown theater to close. Uh, and after that, as you can see, that we did have a theater up at the old uh, mall, which went out of business. We do have a, a movie theater there now. I think it's called The Picture Show. We went there the other day. It's a different experience, okay? You get there, the guy says, the one person in the whole place. Now, in the old days, you had a projectionist with a helper. Because what happened was, and the movies are more than one reel. Anyone ever know what happens is, is as the reel runs down, the projectionist looked out, out of, uh, sort of had a window, he looked out, and in the upper right hand corner there would be a flash. That told him to stop the second camera and shut off the first one so that it would be continuous. And if he was good, you, never, you could, couldn't tell the difference and he would, he would operate that quickly. But there was one guy working, he was putting together a display. There was nobody at the, I guess he was the candy counter. Uh, he sold the tickets. And then he turns the screen around, he said, pick a seat. 
So I look, there's like 50 seats in this theater, and there are only two people in there than before when we get there. And so, you know, why? So I'm like, well, pick a seat. So we pick two seats. And the strange thing is, we go and sit. We, de we decided after we sat down that we were at the other end of the row. And we get up in this empty theater and we're all the way around and sat at the empty seats of the, where we were supposed to be, the assigned seats. Not that there was ever going to be anybody else coming in. So there were four of us that watched the movie that, that particular day. And it had an Art Deco design, as you can see. And, uh, and again, it was the last of the downtown theaters. You can see it was rather elaborate here. Uh, I don't think the, sh the stage here was big enough for, for much. Again, it was primarily, in 1940, that was a movie theater. By that time, vaudeville had pretty much run its course. And the embassy. OK, the embassy was another one. And they catered to kids most of the time. Uh, and they opened in March of 1947. And it, they were built into an old church that had been there. What's interesting about the embassy was that the heating system was in the basement of the house next door. <laughs> <laughs> so if something went wrong, you had to go next door to, 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 to get it set. It did have an orchestra and a loge. Um, and it was. Uh, and they catered to kids. When I, when I was young, we would go down because they showed 10 cartoons on a on a Sunday, on a Saturday morning, 10. And so you were down there for a long time. So it was a, a pretty good investment for, for parents to send your kids down there. And by the way, you know, we went down there. We, we eight, nine years old, 10. Nowadays, I, when I, if, I, if I leave my house at the wrong time, I can't get up the street because there are 4,000 cars waiting to pick up kids, you know? And I, I see the kids come out of the school and they all have legs and things on them, but <laughs> nobody got walks anymore. And we would go down, and we would, if we walked down to the embassy, even though my mother gave me money for the bus, that was more, you could invest in candy or popcorn or something, so. <laughs> By the way, it never had, it never had air conditioning. And, and McAvoy said, in one case, he said, at the kids' matinee, the kids would come down and their dogs would follow them down. And at the end of the movie, he said, there'd be like 10, 15 dogs laying around outside <laughs> waiting for the kids to come out of the movie. <laughs> and again, uh, they ended up showing, guess what, adult movies again. <laughs> the end of the line. And the Royal. What's kind of interesting, Jim Smith had his grand, his grandfather was a policeman and he had his notebook. And Jim Smith, in it there was a reference to being called to the pastime theater. And so the Royal was called the pastime when it first opened in the 1920s. It was owned by the Monis family. And what would happen that everyone remembered that Mr. Monis, again, and sadly, it would be so noisy in there, he'd shut the movie off and he'd go to the front and tell the kids, if you don't stop talking, I'm going to shut it off and send you all home. And he, he never did. What he would do, however, was, was kind of interesting is there was the train track went by there. If a train came by, you couldn't hear the movie. So he'd stop it and back it up and then play it again so you didn't miss anything. Then the Royal ended up, uh, St. Joe's had it for a while, and then it became a casket company. And then finally, it was a youth mu musical theater. I remember seeing an ad a couple of years ago. I don't know what it really is now, to be, to be honest with you. Um, yeah, I think we got, yeah. OK, I just want to show you one little piece, which is, which is classic, by the way. Something that you could do in, in talkies that you couldn't do in uh, silent movies. A, a little more subtle, and and I think you've seen it before, but it's it's a classic, and it, it's Abbott and Costello. So I'm here for retired actors home, and I am the manager. Now you're going to be the manager of the retired actors baseball team. Yes. I would like to join the retired actors baseball team. Oh, you would. I would like to know some of the guys didn't have a team, so if I want to play with them, I know them. I think I'm going to speak them in the home here. I can say hello to them. Oh, sure. Do you know the baseball players now? Oh, 
<laughs> well, let's see now. We have on our team, we have who's on first, what's on second, I don't know who's on third. That's what I want to find out the guy's name. Uh, that's what I want to find out the guy's name. Now tell me, who's on first, what's on second, I don't know who's on third. Uh, can you tell me a man's in a baseball team? Yes. You know the guy's name? Well, oh, sure. Well, you tell me the guy's name's in a baseball well, team. Say, who's on first, what's on second, I don't know who's on third. You may say nothing to me yet. Go ahead and tell me. <laughs> I'm telling you. You said not yet, but I'm telling you. Who's on first? What's on second? I don't know who's on third. You know the guy's name's in the baseball game? Yeah. Well, go ahead. Who's on first? Yes. I mean the guy's name. Who? The guy playing first. Who? The guy playing first base. Who? The guy playing first base. <laughs> who's on first? Who are you asking me? Why? <laughs> Yeah, I can be on a bridge. I'm going to do some basic catching and tomorrow's fishing on my team. 
The kind of comedy you couldn't do in silent movies, okay, but the kind you could do in the talkies. The sad part of this is, is Lou Costello died at the age of 52. He and, he and Abbott had broken up. Uh, they were always arguing money and, and whose name was going to come first, that sort of thing. And uh, they broke up. Uh, he did make a couple of movies on his own, and they weren't very good. And, uh, he was kind of a sad guy in the end, and then died at the age of 52. But he came out of vaudeville, okay? They came out of, they were a great vaudeville act, and that's the kind of act that you saw in vaudeville. So, uh, that's our program, and before, we might as well just... Uh, <laughs> I don't know if anyone has anything they want to add, subtract over here. Uh, am I correct to say during the 30s, the theaters gave out gifts such as depression, glass, or something who collected the entire set? Yeah, we got. Uh, we actually, I remember, I, my mother would pick me up after school, I think on a Tuesday, and what we would end up doing is we would, she went to dish day, so you paid a little extra, and then you might get a cup this week, a sauce the next week. You wanted to make sure you got there when they had the big pieces, like the platters and things, okay? There's a lot of dishes around, you see them in antique places, uh, it's, it's called a tulip patent, and there were hundreds of those patents around, because everybody got the same dishes. Now, even the Durfee gave away dishes. Uh, they didn't plan to, but the Depression really changed them. Believe it or not, the Durfee did not sell popcorn at first. Why? They didn't want the odors bothering people. Popcorn smells kind of good, as a matter of fact. It's sort of an enticement. They also, by the way, didn't want people crunching on that popcorn and disturbing their neighbors. Today, you know, now they're selling it by the barrel uh, when you go into the, into the movie. So, but yes, the, and it, yeah, especially the Depression, it was a way of getting people into the theaters, a little extra. I think at the Durfee, it was, if you sat in the orchestra, Dish day was 40 cents. If you sat in the balcony, it was 25. The dishes that they gave in the theaters, if you turned them over, they had 24 karat gold on them. Yeah, they did. Yeah. Because I have a set in one of my cupboards. Oh, that's nice. Grandmother. As I say, I see them once in a while at, at you know, at, uh, at auctions. Yes. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Again, yes. The Royal Theater was a big hangout of mine when I was a kid on Saturday afternoons, and I remember those little walks by just the motor shutting off, <laughs> turning on the lights and turning off the movie. But he had a uh, ticket taker, ticket seller, ticket taker named Henry. We all knew who Henry was because he had a little bit of a nasally voice. 
the Royal closed. Next time he, we went to the movie was the embassy, and Henry was there as the ticket taker. And so I said to Henry, oh, Henry, you got a job here now? He said, yep, still in show business. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you very much for coming. Yeah, oh, one comment. Um, you had a picture of the Jersey Theater, the interior, and you know how you had the, the arch, and you said how decorative it yeah. was? Do you know what that was for? No. I never knew until I went to a tour of PPAC. Jersey Theater was the only theater around that had a Wilson Theater organ that came out of that. Yeah, you're right, they and did. Wilson, in order to have the sound, you had to have the speakers up so off. So the whole theater <coughs> balcony and those impressions were at the theater, the world speakers. Oh, okay. And that's why they put a, a curtain around it and you had a break, but behind them there's these big speakers. And I get to see the one in Providence. So we were showing that. Jersey Theater had the You're right. They're the only theater I think in the city that had a, an organ. So well they, again, thank you for coming. It's and uh, in two weeks There'll be a program here on cutting ice up at the North Wartupper Pond, back before the refrigeration days. <laughs>